awkward position to be the first. On the one hand, you must prepare the ground, and on the other hand, you know that if you you don't entertain as much as you entertain you or provoke you or enlighten you, the gaps. So maybe I just need to explain as an administrator. Mondays and Fridays, I you call me professor. I quite like that. And then I became an instructional designer. So I quite enjoyed Look for my bow ties, figure out how to tie them. Amazing, and I would like to congratulate you. I was drooling where I was sitting. I drool when I hear of classes of 21. I, I am amazed that you can use student feedback systems. Uh, we have 350,000 students. Uh, we have 6,000 staff. Uh, some of our classes uh, are 14,000 students in the introductory microeconomics course. And we teach those 14,000 students in a 12-week semester with two assignments and one summative examination of two hours. And you complain about 21 students. <laughs> uh, Aziza, do you have a job for me here? I would love to join. <laughs> so, uh, just lastly, before I start the uh, presentation, in medieval times, um, during a festival or a village carnival, they, they, they crowned one of the village inhabitants, most probably the fool, for that day, he, he was often mostly a male, he would be king for the day. And he ruled and he made rules and everyone had fun. So today is my day that they crowned the fool in the audience to be a king for, for 45 minutes. So let's go. So I do not own the copyright of any of the images used in my presentation. I published the presentation this morning on SlideShare, and you're welcome to reuse and change or just forget. Uh, just an overview of the presentation. I would like us to think about laptops in the classroom and dinosaurs. Uh, there's a link, trust me. I would like to share some thoughts about dreaming of losing control. Maybe it's a nightmare. I want us to consider why we need, want, and have to know that students are learning. What's behind this question? Why do we want to know that they're learning? I want to present a short case study of broken data, broken lenses, and broken hopes. And I don't have a conclusion. Um, this was published in 2017 fall. Should professors ban laptops? That's not a problem we have at home. We need the laptops. <laughs> but it, you may have this issue that you may have considered, should professors ban laptops in class? How classroom computer use affects student learning. And then this article say, we do not claim that all computer use in the classroom is harmful. Exercises where computers or tablets are deliberately used may in fact improve in performance. Rather, our results relate to classes where using computers or tablets for note-taking is optional. And yet, they continue to, in, in the, uh, let me just go one back. Laptops are great, but not during a lecture or a meeting. Measuring, and uh, while this, this article says it's not great, you should not bring the laptop into the, into the classroom, it says, Measuring the effect of these laptops is actually very difficult, and yet they have a very strong opinion about it. 
One problem is that students don't use all, don't all use students, or the, the laptops in the same way. And then it says, but a growing body of evidence show that overall, college students learn less when they use computers or tablets during lectures. They also tend to earn worse grades, and the research is unequivocal. Laptops are bad. Haven't we been here before? In 2016, this was published. No, banning laptops is not the answer. In 2014, I found this article, if I would just get there. <laughs> In 2014, we've been down this road before considering the effect of laptops in classrooms, and yet we seem we have a very short memory. In 2014, it was reported from 2011 already. If classroom time is primarily characterized by lectures, why would you do that? But anyway, if classroom time is primarily characterized by lectures, then laptops are probably a destruction. And if students bring them to class for note-taking, it is quite likely if I write an article like that in a scholarly journal, it will not be published. They would say the evidence are inconclusive, and yet this is published in the New York Times and in all our media. So the object in the rear view mirror may be closer than it is. And it's not technology, it's not laptops. I have a question that what may be haunting us isn't that they aren't learning but that we are not solely in control of their learning, as if we ever were. But I think that's possibly simplistic. Losing control is not the only reason why we worried whether they're learning or not. That's not the only reason. I do think we need to consider why do we need and want and have to know that, are, that they are learning. What is behind this question that we have? Because we can know. Uh, why do we need to know that they learn? Because metrics make the world go round. We know all the unbearable lightness of arrogance. We have the tools, that's the reason why we want to know. Our students are broken and need to be fixed, don't kill me now. We want to understand, listen and act, and we want to understand, I don't know what happened to the W. Uh, it's possibly in my room. We want to understand where and how we can help them to do better. So though I suspect that we fear of losing control, I think the answer is possibly among those sevens. Let's just quickly run through them. Why do we want to know that they are learning? Because we can know. For the first time in history, we have more data than ever before. As learning increasingly moves online, we, and the we includes Silicon Valley, it includes governments, data brokers, commercial entities, and higher education, and Blackboard, have access to huge amounts of intersecting and often mutually constitutive data. And we own their data. And we are owned. Try to get out of the agreement with Blackboard and see what happens to your data. Try to move to another learning management platform and see what were the, 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 the fine print below. So we are owned. The learning management systems we use have become a treasure trove of data that we can process, scrape, clean. Listen to the words we use process, scrape, clean, dissect, mine, massage, to find patterns, and at times to make fit those patterns to our assumptions, whether they're learning or not. So why do we need to know that they learn? Because we can. We have the data. We have access to increasing volumes, variety, velocity of data, and this allows us to expand on the traditional scope of institutional research with regard to student data but also to infer relationships unthinkable of a few years ago. We can now say there's a link between their logging data and the time they log in at night and their gender and their home address and possibly 
their Facebook account and their tax returns and whether they have medical insurance and whether they have a criminal record. So we can make these inferred relationships unheard of before and that has implications for what we know and what we want to know. And there is a danger that we mistake the noise for the signal. We have access to so much. We can really check their sleeping patterns and not realize that the noise pollutes our data with false alarms and setting back our ability to understand how the system really works. Reason two, because metrics make the world go round. This is a book by David Beer uh, in 2016, and I read it on a plane here. Uh, six hours to Addis Ababa and another five hours to Cairo. So I finished reading the book. And he says, we are created and recreated by metrics. We live through them, with them, within them. Metrics facilitate the making and the unmaking of judgments about us, the judgments we make of ourselves and the consequences of those judgments as they are felt and experienced in our lives. We play with metrics and we are more often played by them. So when I apply metrics to student performance and to their learning, we define what is true and then we use that to verify the truth. So it's a myopia score. We get back to where we started. And we can only know and me we measure. And when we know, we have the power to claim understanding, to define what is true. And based on this truth, we assign positions, class, potentials, and futures that often lock individuals into fulfilling our truths about them. And by measuring and allocating value, we can find those students who do not fit in our normal distribution curves. And we can isolate them and define them as abnormal and not normal and costing us too much and as not belonging in higher education. So evidence-based education seems to favor a very technocratic model in which it's assumed that the only relevant questions are about the effectiveness of educational means and techniques. And we forget that what is effective is not necessarily desirable or appropriate. And please read these two articles by Gerd Piesta, the one published in 2007, Why What Works Won't Work, <laughs> Evidence pra Practice and a Democratic Deficit in Educational Research. Uh, when I report to my provost or my head of department, he or she wants to know whether something worked, whether there's a direct correlation between the use of this technology and student success. And I don't think that's the right question. And then he followed this up by with why what works still won't work from evidence-based education to value-based education. Our institutional rituals of verification sanction those of us who measure frequently, those of us who are measured frequently, and for all of us who submit our reports to those who need our data to exist. So I go through this ritual of verification twice a year where my performance is agreed upon and managed and measured and I'm fitted as normal or abnormal. And all this data is feeding this ritual for those who need my data to exist. The third reason is because we know everything. When the institutional learning management symbol uh, system remembers not a walled garden, but increasingly Foucault's panopticon, where our tracking systems and recommenders engines watch out over their every move. This was published in 2017, uh, tracking every student's every move. We want to know when they go to the toilet, when they go to the library, when they go to, to the restaurant. We want to know what they bought, how many hamburgers they eat per week and correlate that with their student success. And we may find that eating cheese affects your chances of success. And because we think we can know everything, 
we feed our data fetish, believing that more data are always better data. We believe that bigger data gives us a total picture where if our sample is big enough, that there's nothing we cannot know. We believe that data are neutral and objective and not as subjective as human decisions. They're based on experience, intuition, and wisdom. We create data proxies for that which we cannot measure. And we quantify these. We think finding patterns is enough and we never care to ask why. And this epistemological arrogance leads us to see Jesus in a piece of toast. That is what big data does. It allows us to see patterns where there is no pattern. And it depends on whether you believe. And we call that apophenia, seeing patterns where none actually exists, simply because enormous quantities of data can offer connections that radiate in all different directions. So we think we know everything. The more data we have, the more we can intervene. And it's not necessarily true. Because data is broken. It's incomplete. We never know everything. And yet the decisions we make about our students' lives, we pretend as if the logging data combined with their eating of cheese and their Facebook profile determines their success. The data are broken. The fourth reason, because we have the tools. There's three sources of data. There's a directed form, a digital form of surveillance, wherein the gaze of technology is focused on a person or place by a human operator. You looking at what they're doing on the learning management system. Automated, what an algorithm or a, a artificial intelligence picks up from their behavior online and then volunteered. And there's a beautiful concept that someone wrote to say, we are all digitally promiscuous. We share information with each other and on social media that we should never have shared and that we can never take back. So we have these free sources of information that makes us believe that we know everything and we have the tools to harness all that data. And we move, want to move away from what happened to why did it happen, to what will happen, to how can we make it happen. And you know what is a danger about this is that if, if we cut out the second one, why did it happen? If we think we have enough data that we don't need to say why, but we know what happened, we get to what will happen without reason, reasoning or knowing why it happened. And I think with every layer of analytics, with every tool that we imply to this data, the ethics get more concerning. Reason five, because our students are broken and needs fixing. This was published last year, 2017, November. Higher education should be like hospitals using precision medicine. Because students are broken, they're sick, and we're there to heal them. And just look at this quote. Focus hospitals are built around a very specific value-adding process activity. They take incomplete or broken parts and then transform them into more complete outputs of higher value, most probably for the market, while charging a fee for the outcome. And the proposal is that we should be like hospitals, precision medicine just for you, sir. If you buy this product now, you will be better a more obedient citizen that plays a role in the economies of this country. And this is how I feel about that. <laughs> reasons, oh, not that phase again. Reasons, oh, reason six, because we want to. So these were the negatives. I really believe we want to know that students learned and are learning because we want to understand. We, we really want to listen. We really want to act. We want to know what we can do. It's not about students. We want to know that they learn because we want to know what we can do different, what we can do better or stop doing. We want to know how we can and when we should stop back, step in, not do anything, <laughs> 
intervene, nudge, and care. And I think that that's, I can live with this. As an educator, I want to know that my students learn because I care very deeply about things that I can do better. Not because they're broken, but things that I can do better. We know that we cannot cause learning to happen. We can occasion learning. We can create spaces and occasions where learning can happen. We know that there's a lot of learning that we plan for that does not happen. Sorry to break this news to you, but there's a lot of learning you plan for that does not happen. And some of the learning we plan for may happen, often despite our failures and missed opportunities. And we also know that there's a lot of learning that we did not plan for that actually happens. That's why I want to know that students learn, because I know of the magic of teaching. Seventh reason, the last, and I'm heading towards a close, we want to understand where and how we can help them to be better. So we really want to know what we can do. There is a danger that they don't need superwoman or superman. And this is a quote from a student. Um, if you have come to help us, you can go home. If you have come to accompany us, please come. Let's talk. So it takes away the, the agency from me. And if I want to, to accompany them in making sense of their journey, I'm welcome but they don't need superwoman and they don't need superman. So what are the implications, colleagues, that when we use their data points to describe, diagnose, predict, and prescribe their learning journeys without ever asking them what these data points mean to them and what data would matter to them to allow them to make better choices? We need to report the amount of logging detail. I have to report how many of my students haven't logged on their course site within the first week after registration. That's my duty. But that doesn't say anything about their learning. So what data do we have that could help them to make better choices of their learning? So responsible and ethical learning analytics, and learning analytics is a collection, the analysis and use of student data. Responsible and ethical learning analytics is found in a nexus between their stories and ours. We cannot afford the f to ignore the fact that it is their data, their aspirations, their learning journeys, and that our data collection, analysis, and use may not tell the whole story. I cannot use the number of loggings to determine student success if I haven't spoken to the students. Tell me again why you want to measure their learning. So let me wrap up by the following. So now that we said there's different reasons why we want to know, there's good reasons and there's reasons that are not good. But it is a valid question that we can say, but do they learn? And I would just like to present a very short case study of broken data broken lenses, and broken hope. Three weeks into a 12-week fully online course, and I'm wondering as an instruction, are they learning? I don't see them in the class. I can, can't use a student feedback system. Um, so, so all I have is their logging data, their number of downloads. So, Three weeks into this 12-week course, I must make sense of that data and ask, according to our structure, our criteria, and what we can and want to measure, are they learning? And this is what it looks like. There's six students, seven students. The first student, that's three weeks into the class, logged in 30 times on the right. Um, there's a student that visited to logging 27 times, 21, 21, 55 times, and then there's a student that visited nine topics on the left, and then, but logged in 31 times. So that student that read the least topics 
or the least amount of topics had logged in the most. What is happening there? Another six students. There's a student that three weeks in the course hasn't had any activity. What does it mean and what responsibility do I have in structure to respond to that data? Are they inactive? Are they just a dropout? The words we use to describe the students based on that data. What is my responsibility? Look at student J, visited seven of 200 topics, logged in only four times in over three weeks. And then student L is very interesting, log, visited 18 times, but logging 12, or visited 12, 18 topics, but logged in 12 times. So what is, then this is my question, if I can just get back to that face, what does this mean? But the plot thickens, let me give you exhibit C. This drilled down on student A. You would see that he or she visited 71 topics of 200, logged in 30 times. The first assignment, she or he scored 95%. There was a skill builder exercise that they had to submit a mind map. He or she got 100%. They had to submit a biography 100%. What does that mean compared to this student? Oh, the same student, over three weeks, this student visited 166 times. She spent 6 hours, 38 minutes, 53 seconds on the site. What does it mean? Is she female? Is she male? Where does she live? How does it talk? How many dependents does she have? What time of the night does she log on? Does it matter? I think it does. But before we jump to conclusions, we need to find out what is their narrative. She read, over three weeks, she read 521 posts. She created 11 original posts, and she replied to 54 other posts. That's highly engaged. Compare this with this student, student J, that only submitted two assignments over the three weeks, a very basic assignment of the biography, and the tutorial, 100%, 100%, visited seven topics of 200, and spent only 15 minutes over three weeks. Houston, we have a problem. There's something happening. I cannot say what is happening, and I cannot predict her student success if I haven't spoken to her if or him. Uh, I must find out, over three weeks, he or she read 16 posts, two threads, one reply. Something is not happening, and we need to find out why. And at the end of a 12-week course, have they learned? Um, that's the logging data of a student that completed his or her course with 94 average, 94% average over 12 weeks. They read 884 posts and replied 95 times. They visited 51. What does this mean? Can we now say to students, if you want to be successful in this course, our research shows that you need to log in 51 days over 12 weeks a mess, so we cannot. Students are different. If this data tell a story, whose story is it? Is this a whole story? Who is listening? And what did we miss? I conclude. I blocked this in 2016 in the same course, failing our students, not no noticing the traces we, they leave behind. At that stage, I had 15 students in the class. I was the only instructor. And five weeks into the class, I discovered that the student hasn't submitted free assignments. And suddenly, 
I was marking other assignments. I was responding to other students' posts. I was finding content. I was guiding students. I was counseling students. I was there. And I didn't notice that he fell silent. I thought I cared. I thought I was there. But I did not notice him or her falling behind. I had access to data about his or her, his or her engagement, and somehow I didn't notice. So, colleagues, when a world is reduced to numbers, a measure to what is calculable and laid before us, when humans are summed, aggregated, and accounted for, then much remains forgotten unsaid and concealed. Please tell me again, why do you want to know that they are learning? And how will you know? And why does it matter to you? I thank you. We take questions from the audience. Maybe need one too. Questions? Yes. Yes. I think <laughs> you've really uh, shaken uh, the concept that we can know with what we know at the moment. Yeah, that's true. That you never know the whole picture. But also what we teach in the classroom, and I'm sure you know that is just a minuscule of the actual learning that happens in the student's body. So why they are falling behind or not learning actually would lie outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. And as most theorists know, that if you ask in the audience anybody, what was your most important learning in your life and where did you learn it? It is rarely in a classroom. Mm -hmm. The answers are mostly what they have learned outside is actually what changed their life. So I guess there's a lot that you're saying and a lot of uh, reason for further thinking on thinking that we have. We know what we are doing and we have the answers. Very good, Paul. Thank you. Do you have any other? Yes. Um, I want to thank you for asking all these questions. I think it's really important. But you touched on something that we're all concerned with, that we are in a system that rewards measurement and the existence of our jobs depends on measuring and showing, like you said, our performance both in the classroom of our students. Our accreditation depends on showing evidence of that learning happening in our students. So if we want to move the needle on that structure, what do you think we can do? Wonderful question. I think there was a debate on Digital Pedagogy Lab where the question was, should we grade assignments? And we are, I cannot not grade assignments. It's required. They want a percentage. And I'm not quite sure what the difference between 73 and 75 is. Actually, I don't know what the difference between 70 and 75 is. So it's really messy. So I try to grade in fives or tens. I try to grade incompetent or not competent or resubmit. I try to grade in broader categories within the system. I try to provide students first with feedback and two weeks later with their mark. Uh, I found that to be useful. It, it impacts immensely on my program. And I must plan carefully because the grades have to sub be submitted by a certain date to my administrative department. So that brings all my assessment two weeks earlier. So I try to send my students earlier verbal feedback on their assignments. And then later, I would send them the mark. So, so just, uh, we work in this society. I would love to work in a small liberal art college where I could play. But how does that work with 14,000 students over a 12-week semester? And so, so how scalable is our caring? In 14,000 students over a 12-week semester, I must rely on that data. 
that as it's humanly impossible to engage with that data, I need help. <laughs> so I need an algorithm. I need a computer-based system to analyze that data and almost select the students that haven't logged on the first week and send them an automated email to say, we see you haven't logged on. Is there a problem? <laughs> we care. Uh, if you need to speak to student counseling, this is a number toll free. If you need to administration, toll free. If they haven't responded after that email, an algorithm can pick it up and send another email and say, can we call you? I would rather have that email than no response from the institution. So I think within our constraints of administration and the metric system and the dangers of algorithms, we must find a way to make use of that data, but also find out what it means and what their silences mean and what we don't know. Thank you very much, Paul. And Paul will be here for the next two days. You can find him around in this area if you'd like to talk to him a little bit more. Thank you so much. <laughs>